Hey, uh, where was I? Once a while ago, there was an old peasant and his wife and their three sons. Two of the boys were clever, like a knife, so sharp. But the third son, whew, well, was not. That's being nice. He was a fool. He was like a board without a nail. <laughs> Now it came to pass in those days that the Tsar of all Russia issued a proclamation to every cottage in the land that whosoever could build a flying ship, you know, one that could sail throughout the blue sky, this way and that, hither and yon, yon and hither. I don't know where hither is, but I hear it's nice. They would win the hand of his lovely daughter, the princess. The two clever brothers were naturally eager to try their luck, and so they each resolved to set off. Their father gladly provided them finer clothes than he had ever worn himself, and gave his blessing for their journey. Their mother made up hampers of food, soft white rolls, cooked meats, bottles of corn brandy, and a little potato latke, maybe for later. The fool saw all this, and he said he would go along too, for he wished to receive such fine things and his father's blessings. But his cruel brothers only knocked his cap off and teased him. Imagine the Tsar's daughter marrying that circus ape! <laughs> they said as they were leaving. Even after they had walked a good ways down the road, the poor fool could hear them guffawing loudly. <laughs> Still, for all their cleverness, they were never heard from again. <laughs> Some time passed. Not much, not a little. What am I, a watch? And the fool decided his time to leave had come. But when he told his mother, she only scoffed. Ha! She said. With your fine luck, it's only a matter of hours before you're eaten by a pack of wolves. But his father was of a different mind. Being like a father, he took kind of a stand. If he's eaten, then he's eaten. It's high time we allowed the boy to learn by his own mistakes. Your father may have a kind heart toward you, his mother said, being the good woman that she was. But as for me, if you're eaten by wild beasts, don't even think about coming home. And with that, she gave him some old rusks she had thrown into a sack, and he had left. The fool had not gone far into the woods, not that far, but far enough when he met an ancient wisp of a man leaning on a rude crutch. The man had a wild icicle of a beard and a pair of lively white eyebrows that leapt like snow hairs when he spoke. Where goest thou, young fellow? He asked. Truth be told, I'm going to marry the Tsar's daughter. <laughs> but first, I must build a flying ship. How do you do that? The old man asked. But the fool had not thought that far, because he was a fool, and they never think that far. Well then, said the old man, let's rest a bit and have a bissel to eat. I'm ashamed to offer you what I have here, said the fool. It's good enough for me, but certainly not sort the meal to which one asks guests. <laughs> Although if you are hungry, I'll be more than happy to share what I have. And so he began to unpack his meager fare. But as he did so, his eyes blossomed wide with surprise. There was wine and corn brandy and soft white rolls and all manner of cooked meats and sausages. <gasps> I'm drooling thinking and delicate cheeses, the kind of cheeses that just take you by the nose and lead you around the house. There was even a tin of caviar made from a pair of fish that swam only in champagne. 
and all the plates were made of the finest silver and engraved with scenes of soldiers in battle. So lifelike that if one looked closely, one could imagine one heard the sound of gunfire. The two of them dined on this great repast until they could eat no more. And before long, the fool fell sound asleep against a large tree. When he awoke, he discovered that he was not leaning against a tree. Why, no, but against a smooth hull of a great ship. And the old man, the Altacaca, he was nowhere to be seen. My, my, I can hardly remember being so industrious, thought the fool, but look what I've done! <laughs> and he danced happily around the ship, admiring his handiwork. He quickly jumped aboard and seized the tiller. Instantly, the ship leapt into the air and shot away over the treetops, heading towards hither. Long, he spotted a very thin fellow carrying a roasted pig. Good day to ye, Uncle Skinny, said the fool in a way that only fools can say that makes you laugh and wonder at the same time. Where are you going? What to buy some dinner? But there's a banquet under your nose, the fool called out. Really? The man said. Where? Oh! <laughs> Why, this, this is just a scrap, hardly a mouthful. I'm on my way to marry the Tsar's daughter. There's sure to be a good deal to eat there. Come aboard, big guy. So the big eater climbed aboard, and they sped off. A little bit heavier in the hull, but they got off the ground. <laughs> They flew on and on until, looking down at the earth below, the fool saw a man with ears the size of soup plates lying with one of his ears pressed to the ground. Good day to you, the fool shouted to him. What are you doing down there? Oh, not so loud. I am listening to an ant coughing in Ethiopia, and it's quite a terrible cough he has. Why, you have rather good hearing to hear insects coughing all the way in Ethiopia. Yes, said the man, and it would be a real cinch if only his wife weren't such a terrific snore. What a racket! I wonder if he's not dead with such an infernal hubbub. We'll come aboard, said the fool. We'll go into the wedding of the Tsar's daughter, and you're sure to get an earful there. And so the man came aboard, and they sped off over the hill. His ears were picking up a little wind, so they had to tack them back. Before long, they spotted a man hopping along on one foot with the other tied behind his head. Ahoy there, Lloyd Pegleg! cried the fool. Why are you hopping along on one foot? And what would you have me do on one foot? Pirouette? The man asked. Besides, if I would one time my other foot, I would move too fast for anyone to see me. Why, I would trip over the equator in one stride. Whew. That's pretty quick, the fool said. If you think that's quick, the man replied, you should have seen me before the old arthritis set in. Come aboard, said the fool. We're headed for the wedding of the Tsar's daughter. He's sure to require a speedy messenger. And off they went. They flew on and on, which is more on and on than the on and on before. But who's keeping track? It's a story. Until down by the roadside, they saw a man aiming a gun whose barrel was the length of two plow horses and a clever shego. Ahoy there, William Telski, the fool shouted. Can you tell us what you're aiming at? Well, you see, the man said, rubbing his jaw, there's an ant in Ethiopia with a terrible cough. I should like to put him out of his misery. 
But his wife loves snowing. That's what keeps him ill. The fool replied. Yes, of course. She's the one I'm aiming for. Take your place among us, said the fool. The Tsar is sure to require such a skilled marksman. So the sharpshooter hopped aboard and they sped away. As they were traveling, they saw a shrunken weakling of a man stoop beneath a head of hair so great that he groaned with the effort of carrying it. Ahoy there, Cousin Hunchback! The fool shouted. What sort of burden have you got there? Oh, it's no burden at all, he replied wearily. It's only my strength I'm carrying. There's quite a lot of it, as you can see. Well, there's going to be a wedding of the Tsar's daughter, said the fool. And they're sure to need a strong man there. In any case, they're sure to have a pair of shears for a decent haircut. Climb aboard, Samson. But the weakling couldn't manage it himself. So the fool and the sharpshooter got down and lent him a hand, pulled him up onto the ship, and they sailed across the countryside. <laughs> They didn't meet anyone else on their journey. And after some time had passed, not much and not a little, they came to the palace of the Tsar himself. The Tsar was at the moment eating his dinner, which, tight vod that he was, consisted of no more than a tiny bowl of borscht without any sour cream, which is a meal that you shouldn't have, God willing, ever. He and his daughter, their princess, looked out the window to see where the noise was coming from and saw the strange ship descending with its Meshuggah crew, making crude gestures and waving boisterously at them. One of the Tsar's servants, a miniature genius interested in marrying the Tsar's daughter himself, was watering his mechanical bear at the fountain when the ship landed. Now the Tsar thought that there was no one in the world worthy of his daughter's hand in marriage, although he secretly hoped that the Prince of the Moon would come in a flying ship. But if no one came after a certain time, well, he'd promised a small servant his daughter's hand. seeing the flying ship, the servant immediately perceived that the ship's crew were just a rough group of simple peasants, not the Prince of the Moon, and he quickly went running into the Tsar's dining room, huffing and puffing. Has the Prince of the Moon come for the hand of my lovely daughter? The Tsar asked the servant, beaming with pride. Far from it, your majesty, replied the winded egghead. It's just a loud group of simple moujiks. Moujiks, every one of them. Moujiks, right. What's a moujik? Peasants, your majesty. Peasants? No, peasants. Just a group of low life from the countryside. And the leader of this refresh claims he's fulfilled the requirements of your proclamation with that ship of his and is asked for the hand of your daughter, the princess. Uh-oh, said the Tsar, visibly shaken and physically moving too. Oh, could I see that proclamation again? Yes, your majesty, said the smarty pants, immediately producing the parchment. There it is in black and white. Whoops! <laughs> well, I suppose we're in a jam, all right. So the servant, the Tsar, and the princess sat for a while in complete silence, considering their dilemma. I have it, your majesty, the servant cried. Perhaps you can set this rogue and his gang three impossible tasks, ones they can never fulfill. Now we're getting somewhere, said the Tsar. Like what? You could ask them to eat a thousand loaves of bread.
This nearly tore the Tsar in two. He wanted desperately to rid himself of this unwanted suitor, but as a tightwad, the idea of parting with a thousand loaves of bread was more than he could bear. But in the end, to get rid of the fool, he agreed. So the servant went to the fool, who was turning somersaults and cracking jokes with his party and standing by the fire doing party tricks that I can't talk about, and brought him into the palace. said the fool loudly on seeing the princess. May bread to be! What a vision you are! And my soon to be a father-in-law! May I call you a pop? Pop? said the Tsar, reddening. <laughs> it is his majesty's desire that all suitors first fulfill three small tests before any wedding plans be discussed, the servant said. He then produced a huge volume, nearly as large as he was, and pretended to consult it carefully. Ah, uh, yes. To begin with, you and your hick crew must first eat not less than one thousand loaves of bread. I'm afraid none of my men is very hungry right now, but perhaps I can persuade one of the men to try with me. He summoned the eater from the ship. And no sooner than the loaves were set before them, they were, boom, gone. That's it. Ah, oh, I think I have some loaves coming to me yet, the eater said anxiously. I'm afraid it only tasted like 900, really. I'm quite sure of it. Now, the Tsar was more upset than ever, as you can imagine, and his daughter, the princess, was biting her lip. But the servant was as sly as a fox, and he again thought quickly. Excellent! <laughs> Excellent! And now, he said, as he pretended again to read from the book, Let me see. Ah, yes! <laughs> you must journey down to Africa and fetch a piece of the equator then the Tsar's daughter will be yours. And he and the Tsar chuckled at the fool who seemed to be thinking the matter over. A piece of the equator, eh? The fool said. Any particular size piece? The Tsar and the servant looked at each other uncomfortably. Ta -ta -ta. Size? Stammered the servant. Or, um, <laughs> not really, but you must bring it before sundown, and not a minute later. Well, you probably know what it's like to run about on a full stomach, the fool replied calmly. So if you have no objection, I will ask one of my courtiers to make the journey. And so he arose from the table, went into the courtyard, and described the situation. This is my affair, said the runner who stood up quickly, untied the leg from behind his head, and began to wiggle it to get the stiffness out. The very instant in which he touched it to the ground, <laughs> he was out of sight. And just as he predicted, he tripped over the equator in his first stride and fell headlong into deep East Africa. <laughs> got up, he immediately retied his leg and began to hop along the equator's length, for he hoped to scout out a nice, handsome piece. Now, as everybody knows who's been there, the equator is a bright blue color with worm-like imperfections here and there, because it's been drawn so many times on a map. When he came upon a part of it that was free of imperfections, and was so brilliantly blue that it made the sky look as red as a rose in comparison, he bit off a nice piece the size of a young pig, put it in his pocket, and sat down against a tree to take a nap. During the time that the runner was gone, the fool was conversing with the Tsar and the princess. After some time, though, he wondered where his friend was, and so he went out to the ship. Uh-oh, said the 
hero with his ear to the ground. A swift bear has fallen under a tree. I can hear him snoring. And there's a flea asleep in the hair on the very top of his head. Just then rose back from the widow's peak. Wait, oh, sorry, twelve. And the flea snoring, too. I see him, said the sharpshooter. I see him. Who? Lord Pegleg? asked the fool. Not the flea. I now see Pegleg just below the flea. Leave it to me. The sharpshooter quickly picked up his rifle, aimed carefully, and allowing for wind, curvature, and spin of the earth, continental drift, and the expansion of the universe, and the chance that he might sneeze, squeezed the trigger. The bullet hit the flea squarely amidships which is to say it struck it in the third button on his brocaded flea's vest, dead bullseye, and ricocheted loudly, ka-ping, off the embossed buckle on his high-heeled shoe. Not a bad shot. The sound was so loud that it immediately woke the runner, who, seeing that the sun was about to set, quickly put both feet on the ground. Faster than 63 speeding bullets arrived at the Tsar's palace with the equator safely in his pocket. gave it to the fool, who immediately brought it into the Tsar and his daughter. Now the Tsar began growing quite pale, and his daughter was crossing and uncrossing her eyes unattractively. But, again, the servant thought quickly. Well, this is all well and good, he said, winking at the Tsar. <laughs> but there is one more task listed which you must fulfill. And again, he pretended to read from that large book. Oh, yes. You must find a bird that cannot fly, yet loves to swim, and has near a single feather on its body, and you must fetch it here by sunup, tomorrow. No pressure. Good night. So the fool returned to the ship and related the situation. Now, naturally, the ether was aware of all the birds in the world that could be eaten. And he said that he had heard of such birds as the servant described. But he said that they lived at the very bottom of the world, far beyond the equator, where it was very cold. So the sharpshooter immediately looked in that direction and with a little squinting said, Aha, I see some birds who cannot fly and have no feathers. But when they dive into the water, they stay underneath and I cannot see them swimming. So the hearer put his ear to the ground and with a little straining said, I can hear those birds with no feathers who cannot fly, and I hear their wings flapping underwater as they swim. That settled it. Of course, the runner was again eager to make the journey and fetch the bird, and he was already beginning to untie his leg, but the sharpshooter objected strongly. No, 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 no. And he added one more. No, he said to them. You see. I have run out of bullets. If the runner should fall asleep again, we'll be quite powerless to rouse him. He is simply cannot go. So they sat there silently thinking. But just one-tenth of a second before they were about to give up, the hairy weakling clambered out of the ship hold and blinked at the twilight, for he'd been sleeping soundly below deck since her arrival. I believe it's high time I puffed up, he announced to them weakly. Yes. Yes, time to puff up indeed. And immediately he began to inhale, quite vigorously, so vigorously, in fact, that anything that was not tied down was soon sucked into his lungs. And as he did this, a very strange thing took place. His puny body began to inflate, while at the same time his oppressive mane began to retreat back into his head. And by the time he was through, he was as big and strong as he had been weak and small, and his pet was as shiny as a shaved melon. I thought you looked better with a haircut, said the fool, turning a handspring. The puffer then opined that if they were unprepared to travel to the South Pole, they would have to bring the South Pole to them. And so, grabbing a hold of a piece of turf, he began quickly hauling the countryside toward himself like a sailcloth. The fool and his crew watched in absolute amazement as houses and whole villages 
appeared on the horizon like ships, came toward them and then disappeared into the pile behind the puffer. As daylight left them, entire countries passed before their eyes. Their inhabitants going about their lives as though everything were completely normal. Whole families passing by them. This is called traveling at the speed of light, or the theory of relatives. And there was one man named Einstein who saw this and went, oh, what an idea. But that's another story. On and on it went. Faster and faster, the puffer pulled, never stopping. He pulled and he pulled, all through the night, on and on and on. Finally, just as he was running out of strength and the first rays of the sun were beginning to redden the horizon, the South Pole skidded to a halt, right in the center of the Tsar's courtyard, and his job was done. Now. When the Tsar woke up, he immediately looked out his window. There, in the courtyard below, he beheld the hundreds and hundreds of penguins, which is Eskimo for tuxedo, waddling about and swimming in the courtyard fountain while behind the puffer lay the entire earth in a single wrinkled pile. And who should be standing on his head on top of the South Pole in the center of the courtyard? <laughs> That's right, who indeed, but the fool himself. Of course, the Tsar shook with fear at all that he saw, for what could he do? Without a moment's hesitation, he threw open his bedroom window and shouted down to the fool, Congratulations, my dear son-in-law. She's all yours. So the fool and the princess were married that very morning, and the Tsar gave the fool half of his kingdom, which is a nice deal, and fired his pint-sized servant who ran off to the mountains and opened the hotel, while the companions in the flying ship took up the best quarters in the palace. They were forever by his side, cracking jokes, singing songs, and forming the first men's club, and they and the fool were very happy. And as for the princess, well, she got used to it.